Good morning, everyone, and welcome to day five of Cyber School. We're going to be spending all three of today's lessons with James. He's got some super content lined up for us. So, firstly, we're going to be kicking off with the lesson of how to break secret codes, which follows on from his first lesson, how to create secret codes. So, following this lesson at 10 a.m., we've also got a lesson at 11 a.m., which we're going to learn about the Enigma machine. So, during the Second World War, Germany used this machine to create super secret codes. Uh, these codes were actually finally cracked by GCHQ here in the UK, ending the, the Second World War several years earlier. If you want to be a spy in the future, definitely stick around for that lesson after this. Uh, guys, have a great day today. Uh, we've loved teaching you over the last week. It's been great. Um, stay safe, stay home, and have a great weekend if I don't see you uh, next time. Okay, bye. Hello, I hope you all enjoyed Monday's lesson and that you'll enjoy today's as well. For this one, we're carrying on a bit with the Caesar cipher and how to break it if you don't have the key. First though, just a few reminders of some words we used last time. You don't need to worry about steganography, which was hidden writing, or transposition, which was about moving letters around this time, since we won't be using them, but they are useful words to remember. Last time we spoke about ciphers being secret codes, with the important bit being the secret to how they're made. We call that secret the key. We also spoke about clear text, which is a normal message that anyone can read, and cipher text, which is a message that's been made secret using a cipher and a key, and only someone with the key should be able to read it. We're about to find out why that's not quite true. We spoke about substitution ciphers like the Caesar cipher, which is what we'll be breaking today. So first of all, I'll just get a Caesar cipher message up. And there we go. <coughs> I used the Caesar cipher to encode this and then completely forgot what the key was. So there's a couple of ways we can try and find out what it is and what the clear text is underneath it. One way, and in a way the easiest but most tedious, is brute force where we try every possible key until we find the right one. So what we would do is first try A equals B, then A equals C, then A equals D, and write it out until we know whether or not that key is working. So I'll just do that now. So A equals B does not work, A equals C does not work, and A equals D gives us the right key. We were lucky it was one of the early ones, otherwise we'd have to do it up to 25 times, which would get tiring. There is another way to do it that works on more than just the Caesar cipher. In fact, it will work on any monoalphabetic cipher quite well, and will even work on some others. As I mentioned last time, monoalphabetic ciphers use only one cipher alphabet for a message. This will work for any message where the clear text is in English. The way to do it will work for other languages, but you'll need to find out how common letters are for each language. This will even work where the alphabet isn't an actual alphabet. So long as the message underneath it, the clear text message, is in English, and each symbol represents one letter, you can use this method to try and uncover the clear text message and discover the key. It's easier the longer the message is, but even with short ones, there are some tricks to make it work. The most important bit is to understand this chart, and really only the start of this chart. This is what we call a frequency chart, and it shows how often letters occur if you've got a hundred letters in English in a sentence. So, as you can see, E appears most of all, much more than any other, followed shortly by T and then A, and we can ignore the others, they don't really matter. So I'm just going to tuck the frequency chart away, so it's not in our way, but you can still see it. And next thing we need, of course, is our ciphertext. So let's get that up. As you can see, this is quite a long message. Uh, key could be any of the letters, because it is Caesar cipher. 
and we'd expect the most common letter to be E in our secret message. So which is the most common? You can count if you want or I could tell you I've already counted and the most common one is H. So next what we need to do is say well if H is E what's the key to this message? E is the fifth letter of the alphabet and H is the eighth letter of the alphabet so if H is E then the cipher alphabet has been moved three letters from the clear text alphabet. If we move it back three letters, let's see what we get. And there we go, worked perfectly. But why did I say this is better for longer messages? Well, if we try it with a shorter message, let's see what happens. So here is our short cipher text. Fine. And the most common letter in this one is V. So we have seven V's, meaning we should try E equals V as the key to it. So what happens when we try that? Well, unfortunately, it doesn't work. Because this is a short message, it doesn't have enough letters for the rule about E being the most common to be trusted. In fact, in this case, E is the second most common letter, and there's only a difference of one. There's six of the other letter, or six E's, and seven of the other letter. So, if we take the second most common letter in this message, which is H again, let's try that. That's the same method as before, meaning we move the cipher alphabet three letters away from the clear text alphabet and let's see what we end up with. There we go, translates perfectly. That's exactly the answer we're expecting. Now, I know that my head is hurting a bit with all these codes and alphabets, so if you wanted to take a quick break, now might be the time by pausing the video. We're going to be dealing with a very strange alphabet next time before we move on to something a bit more advanced. But if you would like to take a quick break, now's the time to do it. And now we're going to move on to alphabets that we don't recognize. So this will be the assignment. And I'm a fan of the Zelda games, which you may have heard of or may not, uh, particularly Breath of the Wild. And Breath of the Wild, the programmers, the people who built the game, built a language into it, which is called Sheikah. So let's take a look at what Sheikah looks like. There we are. That's a message written out in Sheikah. It's quite a long message, and I'm not going to give you the full answer on this one. This will be your assignment. There is a worksheet in the description, and I will give you some clues. First of all, you can do the assignment now if you want by pausing the video, or you can do it after the class. <coughs> the worksheet is in the description. And I will gradually, as the week goes on, put up a few more videos to explain how to break different bits of it. If you manage to break the code, you will find an online quiz in the description as well, where you can put in your answers to find out if you got it right. The message is made up of some silly riddles, uh, so I've made it a bit easier on you. And first of all, we need to work out which letter is E. It's definitely the most common one in this one because I wrote it and counted to make sure. And the most common symbol is a squiggly one that looks like an unhappy person. So I'll just highlight that. As you can see, it appears lots of times. And this is in the worksheet as well. So E is that symbol. And I've given the symbols for the next few most common characters as well as well as numbers and punctuation that can be difficult. That won't give you everything, so I have given you a few more clues. As we've got E and T as two of the more common letters, 
what I've done is said that any three letter word beginning with T and ending with E is probably the. The is the most common word in the English language. So you can make a guess that anything that starts with T, ends with E and is three letters will be the. I've also given you a couple of other short words, in and what, which are quite common in the message. And you might be able to guess some other words just using the letters you've already got. You should be able to decode it, but as I said, I will be working through over the rest of, well, over next week to give you a few more hints and by the end of the week I will go through the whole thing. <clears throat> Treat it as a puzzle, pick it up and put it down when you feel like it, and now is the time to pause if you want to start on the assignment straight away and didn't take a break earlier. Otherwise, I'll be going on to how we can make a code which doesn't let someone break it in this way at all. And these are polyalphabetic codes. So we're going to crack on now with polyalphabetic ciphers. And let's get going. Uh, for this, we're going to use a much simpler alphabet. So I'm going to use an alphabet I've made up which only has five symbols in it. So you can count these symbols and treat them as if they're letters, because letters don't make any difference when you're sending a message, if people understand what you mean. And here is my very clever alphabet. As you can see, it's happy, devil, uh, crying, smiley, angel, and sleepy. And I'm going to try and encrypt these and send a message with them. So I'll just tuck them up there for now. And the message I'm going to send is a bit about how I'm feeling at the moment. So I'm extremely tired and that's making me short-tempered and a bit sad. So if we tuck the message away as well. There we go. Now, with a polyalphabetic <coughs> cipher, things are slightly different. Obviously with the monoalphabetic cipher like Caesar, we have one letter keys, so A equals D, and really D is the key there. With a polyalphabetic cipher, we actually need multiple letters in the key. And so the key I'm going to use for this one is here. And as you can see, it's happy, crying face, angel. And we'll get to how you use this in a moment, because the next thing we have to move on to is how we build up what we call our code table. And the code table consists of the whole alphabet and the whole alphabet written out another way. For those of you who are going to take the more advanced lesson in a bit, we'll be talking about this even more when we talk about how the Enigma machine worked. But for now, our code table just involves the alphabet being written across the top and the alphabet being written down the side and then every possible combination so you can see that there's uh, the normal alphabet on the top row then the normal alphabet moved one place to the left normal alphabet moved two places to the left three places and four places obviously if you're doing this with the English alphabet you've got 26 letters across the top row and 26 down the side so you've got a lot more to write out, which is why I'm doing this simplified one for now. So with this code table, the way it works to encipher the message is that we take our key and we take the plain text message or the clear text message we want to send. So for that we have sleepy and we have happy for the key. And all that you need to do is essentially draw a line down and a line across from each of those and where they cross is your first cipher letter now don't worry that in this case the cipher text is the claim same as the clear text for this first character that will change so let's take the next one we've got sleepy again 
and this time we've got uh, crying face for the key letter so here we go and there we go we've now got devil is the ciphertext so what you might have noticed is when you were using the Caesar cipher before every letter always turned into the same letter so as we had earlier E always equaled H when you're using a polyalphabetic cipher it changes so instead of having E equals H here we might have E equals X or anything else or sleepy equals smiley sleepy equals devil face then the next letter in it is a devil face so I'll draw a line down from devil and I then draw a line across from the next letter in the key which is the angel and that gives us another sleepy and we repeat this for all of them now because I only put three letters in the key what we have to do now is repeat the key so we go from the beginning of the key again so we've now got devil down and we have happy across which gives us a devil face uh, sorry no it doesn't yeah, devil down happy across yeah, gives us a devil face and I've actually got that one wrong so ignore that uh, but next one we have crying and we have crying so drawing down on crying gives us another sleepy face and finally we have crying and we have angel so crying and angel gives us a happy face and there we go so that's now a poly alphabetically encrypted set of emojis hopefully you can see how this would work with just about any alphabet you care to name uh, we are now at the end of this lesson but if you've done anything with the unfamiliar alphabet keep an eye out in TV shows and games because a lot of them will use real language behind secret alphabets and you never know what you might find trying to decipher them and if you enjoyed the bit on polyalphabetic ciphers we'll be going a lot more into that and how they're used with the Enigma machine which you might have heard of uh, to make a code which we can break now through brute force but at the time was absolutely impossible thank you and uh, good afternoon i'll see you shortly if you're coming to the next lesson